Hello everyone, my name is Pepsilk and welcome to Thoughts On. This is a series where I analyze games and give my opinions on them. Today, we'll be looking at Deus Ex Human Revolution. Human Revolution is one of my favorite games of all time, incorporating stealth and action elements alongside a great and interesting narrative, resulting in an immersive sim that brought this old series back to life. Streamlined and developed for consoles on top of PC, which is the only version that the two previous games, Deus Ex and Deus Ex Invisible War were developed in, this game brought the series to a new audience and sold over 600,000 copies in its first week of release, which is very impressive for a new series for some, an old series for someone like me. More appealing to the old than the new. I love this game to death and I've been wanting to make a video on it ever since I started YouTube, but never bothered due to constraints and life issues. After recently finishing it over the past week, I can finally speak my thoughts on it, the good things it does, the bad things it does, and why I believe it to be an underrated masterpiece that deserves attention 11 years after its release. Let's talk about it, shall we? A quick disclaimer, I am playing the Director's Cut version of Human Revolution on PC, which is currently the only version you can get through Steam, as I just decided to terminate and delete the original. Now granted, I have both copies, but ultimately decided on Director's Cut since it can be bought safely, and though there are subtle differences between the two versions, the package is ultimately the same. The big catch is that the Director's Cut version comes with all of the DLC, so no need to buy separate stuff if you decide to buy the original version. If you want to get the original to feel nostalgic like I did and play how it was intended, you can get it through third-party key sites, just make sure they're verified and have sold many keys because you don't want to get scammed. If there is anything of interest that makes me bring up the original, I will be sure to mention it. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe with notifications turned on for more gaming content. Deus Ex Human Revolution is a prequel to the original Deus Ex, setting back 25 years, with Deus Ex taking place in 2052 and Human Revolution taking place in 2027. I can't believe we're approaching that year, and the best thing we've gotten so far that's human enhancement are prosthetics, which have helped lots and lots of people. I'm not sure if there's anything else that could be augment related, but please let me know in the comments. I'd love to do some research and maybe start a conversation about augments and technology in our current generation. You play as ex-SWAT commander Adam Jensen, assigned chief of security for Sarif Industries, company who has had a major breakthrough thanks to Dr. Megan Reed. Humanity has discovered augmentations, which are cybernetic human enhancements that grant superpower abilities from sports to strength, social, and intellect. The world is entering the stage of transhumanism, where augmentation technology is helping to advance and evolve human society, entering a new age. There are people who strongly agree with it, and those who strongly oppose it, claiming that it's removing the human soul and turning it into something that you're not. Adam is making preparations for Megan and her team as they are bound for Washington, where they'll be speaking on their research to the whole world. The major breakthrough that Megan discovered from augmentations is that she has found a way to safely put these enhancements into our bodies without needing anti-rejection medicine known as neuropazine, a drug that helps the body not malfunction or shut down due to these implants. Just as things are going well, an alarm goes off on the research floor, prompting a break-in from a group of special ops mercenaries that end up taking lives kidnapping Megan and her team and leaving Adam in critical condition, prompting David Sarif to invest lots of money into saving Adam and making him an absolute weapon and the first augmented person to not rely on neuropathy. This event sets the plot for the entirety of the game, as six months after the incident, Adam is called back into the field. Throughout the game, you'll be visiting many locations, such as Detroit and China, talking and initiating dialogue with key characters, and unfolding a plot that stretches bigger than just augmentation companies, with governments all wanting a piece of the pie and the means to control everyone in the world. The game's story for the most part is great, with many twists and turns that will surely make the player have many questions that will either be answered or unanswered. The game never bothers to slow down, as new characters get introduced into the mix, and the side quests help to tell more stories, though you can approach it at your own pace without feeling the need to rush it. Not exactly. My only problem with the story is the lack of backstory for the mercenaries, which are Barrett, Namir, and Yelena. Now granted with Barrett, it's sort of justified because you meet him straight away and he gets given the kill order by Namir, so you're not supposed to really know about him. But the other two don't appear until later in the game, and there's no sections where you engage in conversation with them outside of cutscenes. They could have at least extended the game a bit longer by adding said conversations, or maybe have a level or two or something beforehand giving us time to learn about their motives and why they're doing their job aside from the money and the Illuminati, one of the game's main forces and the ones that want to manipulate augmentation technology to bend the world to their knees. I'm going to assume that they may have had plans to do something like this, but must have been cut short due to constraints. To sort of back my example up, I want to mention Handsome Jack from Borderlands 2, as I think he's a good example of getting a backstory for a villain. 
In Borderlands 2, Jack is the an antagonist and tries to contact you on many occasions throughout the game. Talking about his past, belittling you, calling you the villain, and getting some insight into some of the things he did for the greater good as he puts it. They even have side quests to help flesh him out more as well. These sorts of things are great because it adds backstory and gives the player a sense of likeness towards Jack, as we come by the end of the game to understand his motives and why he wants to rid Pandora of all human scum. Compare that to Human Revolution, and we have characters that get told an action or say some final words before killing you, and that's it. Even the trailer they show about these characters has more love and story put into it than the actual game. If they implemented something to help flesh out the antagonists more, they would be more memorable and exciting to fight when you eventually fight them. He will probably only remember them for how hard they are, because they can be a pain to fight on the hardest difficulty. The only antagonist I'd say has something like this is Zhao, who gets lots of cutscene time and you can sort of see her motives and why she wants to buy out augmented companies, since she's the CEO of the biggest medical company in the world. Her best moment is at the end when she reveals the Hiren project, an advanced computer system designed to collect and store huge amounts of data, all while using live humans. This will later become a precursor in the original Deus Ex, where you're given the choice to sync your own brain to a supercomputer by the name of Helios as a means of manipulating data. Eliza Kassan is another interesting highlight for me too, as I found out on my fifth playthrough that she was the first supercomputer that the Illuminati made to trial the idea of manipulation and distribution of data. Which is interesting because it makes me question how media does that now, which is media bias, right? Because we have so many media outlets, every outlet always finds a different way to talk about the same topic like politics, for example. But being able to spin all media from one news station, which is the only news station as far as I'm concerned, different story. One of Human Revolution's greatest strengths is its dialogue, which is done through meaningful, slow, and strong conversations that require methodical thinking. There are two different types of conversations, which are the normal one-on-ones with conversation wheels like Mass Effect, and the methodical conversations which require you to convince and get someone to be by your side. The way you can tell the difference is with either camera angles or the social enhancer, one of the augments Jensen can get where it'll pull up character traits and a description of what the character is like. With camera angles, the game shows the normal conversations in like a 45 degree -ish angle, and it goes back and forth between you and the character, whereas the methodical ones face straight and never show Jensen when he's talking. The voice acting is really well done, and on a AAA professional level too, with okay lip syncing and good facial expressions for a 2011 game. Just don't pay too much attention to that when you engage because you'll end up getting annoyed by how not sync it is. I just put subtitles on and use that as my eye candy instead. Decisions you make throughout the methodical conversations can influence a character to give you a good outcome or a bad one. Some examples include conversations between Wayne Haas and William Taggart. Haas was your wingman back when you were in SWAT and took responsibility for the murder of an augmented kid, as Jensen opted out of the force shortly after. You meet him for the first time in years and he spits at your face, wanting you to take responsibility for what happened that day. Throughout this conversation, you try to reason with Haas and accept that the past is the past and he should move on from it. Jensen also offers a job for him in case he loses the one at the police station. If you succeed in this conversation, he will grant you access to the morgue without needing to worry about any police, as you're required to get in there without being spotted. Taggart's conversation revolves around Jensen attempting to expose Taggart and force him to reveal a main character's location in front of the press, which I gotta admit, he's got pretty big balls to do that. Throughout this conversation, you use the audio log retrieved from a location prior and try to backfire it towards him, like a blackmail sort of thing to insinuate a heavy response and force him to come clean about his best man. If you do fail this however, you'll have to sneak your way and look around for the information yourself. You gotta appreciate this sort of dialogue in games because they can be so intense, especially in moments of crisis, as they make you question things. Something that would be improved in the game's sequel, Mankind Divided. For a game of 2011 to have this sort of caliber, it's very well done. And yes, this came out before Skyrim blew everything out of the water. Human Revolution's gameplay consists of combat and stealth elements, with the player having the choice on which playstyle they want to go for. Or you can do both. The choice is ultimately yours. Personally, as a first-person cover shooter, I don't think the combat is that great, mostly because of the scarcity of ammo and lack of combat options. The gunplay is okay and serviceable with many weapons to use. Guns have a bit of kick which can be mitigated with a recoil augmentation, but we'll get into the augmentations later. The beauty of this game lies in stealth, where there are multiple paths and ways to approach your objective. This is where idas put majority of their time into, and it shows, given that the game also has a ton of stealth augmentations that you can get your hands on as well. 
You can go through vents, climb ladders, jump across buildings, or use crates to create a wall of sorts that you can jump on, then jump over the area you want to go to. Every time I play Human Revolution, I always run it up in stealth because the game is a lot more satisfying that way, and you always discover a new path of sorts when you play through the game for the first time in a few months or a year. Like the original Deus Ex, you have the freedom to do as you please, exploring and completing quests whenever you feel like. This applies more to the game's two hub areas, Detroit and Hangsha, as you'll have a big space to explore and look around for supplies and any goodies that might serve a purpose later down the line, which is essential for immersive sims. Though the hubs may appear linear at first glance, there are many gimmicks and secret locations that you'll discover, which can open up new pathways and even net you a new weapon or two. Speaking of searching for supplies, the inventory system works a lot like Resident Evil 4's, allowing players to move and reorganize items to their own content. You can go completely OCD, which I'd approve of, or be like me and sort it out in a way which allows you to make space for better gear. You can also increase the inventory space by obtaining an augmentation, which I'll explain now. As Jensen progresses through the game, you will earn Praxis Kits, which are received by earning XP, doing in-game actions such as hacking computers, taking out enemies, and completing quests. You can also earn XP by discovering locations and navigating areas in stealth without being detected or killing anyone. Kits can be purchased in a limb clinic at one of the hubs or can be found in the game world. These augmentations impact the way you play and open up new opportunities, such as the Icarus landing system, an org that prevents any sort of fall damage and allows you to perform a stomp move that stuns all enemies within its radius. There's the cloaking system, a must-have for stealth players that lets you go invisible and be safe from enemies, cameras, and lasers. The social enhancer, mentioned before, provides descriptions on characters while also giving you a new option which lets you pick from three options and the option you should pick is based on how much a character feels to a certain personality, which are Alpha, Beta, and Omega. You've also got hacking skills, which make hacking a hell of a lot easier. Leg augments that improve sprint speed and silence your footsteps. A rebreather that lets you breathe through gas. Dermal armor, which reduces damage taken, and more. Objectives are also shown on the map, so you won't get lost in navigating through the game world. This can come at both a positive and a negative for the game because in the original Deus Ex, you had to rely solely on images, notes, and audio logs in order to figure out what you're doing and where you're going to. It will be a positive because it gives players a sense of direction without mindlessly roaming around figuring out where the heck to go. Hacking is a fun mini game that gets the player to hack nodes, which have a chance of triggering an alarm. If an alarm is triggered, you'll have an X amount of time to hack them before it locks you down for good. I find it pretty fun and it never gets boring as each hack is always different. If you happen to have full inventory space due to mindlessly picking everything up like I do because I want those sweet credits for them Praxis kits, you can seek your stuff at merchants found throughout the game. They'll also sell you items too like weapon upgrades, automatic hacking systems, grenades, and weapons. All items sell for the same price, so there's no need to go looking for a specific merchant that may want to buy something at a higher price. Sorry, for a higher price. Outside of the main quest, there are side quests available, all which add more to the story and the world of Human Revolution. You get spoon-fed these in the beginning of Detroit as characters will contact or approach you about these situations, or will have to find them yourself when you reach Hang Sha. The spoon-feeding is justified as Ida's is introducing you into the game's world and wants you to keep an eye out going forward after completing the ones in Detroit, as you'll get some new toys and lots of XP for completing them. A few quests that you'll do include further investigating the South Industries incident, getting a debt from a broker who paid the trials to receive a social enhancer, participating in an undercover sting operation that has many ways to complete it, grant you, and helping Malik find out the true cause of her best friend's death. My favorite side quest would have to be Acquaintances Forgotten, which provides backstory on the origin of Adam Jensen, which, as it turns out, was part of a genetic experiment at White Helix Labs in Versalife, a multinational company. You find out you were saved and needed to be taken care of because your DNA is special and was a spark for Megan's breakthrough and not needing neuropazine for augmentations. It also made me realize why Sarif went out of his way to invest into Adam since he's special and possesses a gift that no one else has. If Adam was just a nobody and didn't have that DNA, I have no doubt that Sarif would have just left him for dead outright like everyone else that died in the incident. Jensen's parents were also Versalife employees and were the ones responsible for the genetic experiments done on babies. But because the babies weren't suitable for the research and didn't want the word to get out, they started a fire in the lab that ultimately got them both killed and Jensen was the last person alive before being picked up by Michelle. I also find it interesting when she says that Adam is too old to be that person, saying he's about 12 or so years old as of 2027. 
which prompted me to think of a theory where Jensen has age acceleration and is able to age a lot faster than the average human being. This theory can be debunked, however, as she has dementia, which is present throughout the conversation with her as she changes the topic to getting her dinner shortly after bringing up the labs. If you have the social enhancer, you can convince her to reveal more information about what happened, as talking to her normally will only get her to recall one moment, then that's it. This one particular quest is just a taste of what you can get, as exploring and finding these people will make your playthrough a hell of a lot more fun too. It's pretty easy to find them as they'll always be named NPCs. I never realized this until my recent playthrough, but this game loves using elevators and vents for about 80% of the game. The elevators get me the most because even though I don't mind it as a design choice seemingly there to prevent loading screens and allow textures to render, I can't help but wonder if they had another contingency or plan to take some of these elevators out. The first few times you use an elevator, I can live with that because we're in tall buildings and you wouldn't want to run up a lot of staircases to get to your destination. But by the time you hit halfway, it just becomes a bit annoying and I wish that items provided alternatives or just a different path to get to the destination that we need to go. Example, the Hangshaw Court Gardens is an apartment complex that has one elevator connecting all of the floors. I would have loved to see Ida try to incorporate other ways on top of just taking the elevator, like climbing construction areas if you have the jump augment, or seemingly finding the stairs to run up to that floor, or maybe a ladder on the roof which lets you climb up the floor below the one that you need to get to. In the original Deus Ex, there was always multiple ways to approach the same area, it never felt one-sided majority of the time, and you always discover something new every time you play through it. Now, I know this isn't the same for the entire game, since multipathing plays a big part in its game design, but one scenario bits like this one should have been more than just a simple elevator button press. As for the vents, I don't think this is generally a bad thing, given that in stealth, vents are your best friend, but there's just so many of them that I think could have used some recycling and be scrapped just a little bit to open up more unique pathways. This isn't a major deal for me, just a little nitpick of mine that I have because for the majority of the game, I'm always going through a vent to get to a location, and that's fine. Just a bit too many times is all. Something which they would also end up improving in Mankind Divided as well, with the help of the new augmentations the game adds. You're probably wondering why my game looks a bit... different. I'm using the Deus Ex Human Revolution Director's Cut Gold FX mod, or DXHRFC-GFX for short, which is a mod that aims to bring back the gold filter from the original alongside its post-processing. I'm a sucker for the piss filter because it symbolized the golden age of augmentation technology, at least that's my belief for the filter existing there in the first place, and helped to make the game stand out as its own visual masterpiece. The director's cut saw this filter being removed and garnered a lot of attention from fans, myself included, who hated this being removed. Heck, I'm not sure why people hate on this filter in the first place. It's a bit odd. But I'm not here to start a debate about why a filter looking like piss is bad for a video game. The mod has a few presets and some lighting options that you can adjust in its own menu, choosing between the DC and original version, alongside some color settings that you can adjust to your own liking. It's not 100% accurate as the game's lighting was changed in the director's cut, but it's almost as close as we got it in the original and I highly recommend downloading it if you want an experience on what the game looked like back in 2011. I'll put a link in the description with the Steam guide for it. Ah yes, the good old human revolution boss fights. Love them or hate them, they're a pain in the bum and an annoyance to do. Seeing that the boss battles were developed by a different dev team known as Grit Entertainment. I only just found out about this too, as I always questioned why the boss fights were so different and forced you into combat as opposed to everything else in the game. Thankfully, in the director's cut, Idas went out of their way to change up all of the boss fights, adding new areas and ways to kill said boss, which was a huge improvement and a walking W for the game. I was walking around the Nimir fight after I finished killing him and found an upstairs area that I've never bothered to go to but could have to get more items and move myself away from the main floor. Yelena's boss fight even has an upper level with gas canisters that you can shoot to stun her, giving a window of opportunity. However, I did notice a little something as I was playing through the boss fights again. The game spoon feeds you and gives you items in every arena in the event that you happen to not have the gear needed to kill a boss. Which at first glance is a good thing because for stealth runners like me, having some loud gear is handy for disposing of these mercenaries. But on the other hand, it kind of ruins the idea of an immersive sim, which is having to make sacrifices in your inventory so that you can acquire strong items at the cost of losing some important ones. I remember very often in the original Deus Ex, I had to make decisions to remove items from my inventory to make space for special weapons such as a Gep gun so that I can use it for an up and coming boss fight but at the cost of losing some core items such as ammo and multi-tools. In Human Revolution, even though you can drop items, 
the cost of dropping items isn't as punishing, since by the time you get to the boss fight, there'll be goodies waiting for you anyway. You just have to know where to find them, which I think ruins the immersion part for me. But at the same time, you can't help but think how different it would be if you could stealth them by taking them out non-lethally. Thankfully, this became an option in Mankind Divided, and the game doesn't spoon-feed you much there for supplies. So I think having the option to knock them out would have been a major turning point in how the boss fights function and how gear is distributed in these arenas. This is also another nitpick that I had while playing, but it's more of a minor complaint that you can just skip past this entirely and be fine with being given stuff to be rid of these still somewhat horrible boss fights. With great director's cuts comes great DLC, and this version comes with the Missing Link DLC, a 3-4 hour experience that takes place over the 3 missing days between Hangsha and Singapore, where Jensen gets spotted while in the stasis pod and gets tortured in some sort of EMP chair, as it turns off his augmentations. You'll have to start fresh again and work alongside an anonymous hacker to figure out what Bell Tower is up to, and why people are being held at the Rifleman Bank Station. Surprisingly, I had no recollection of playing this back when I played the original, so this is a first time experience for me, and I freaking enjoyed every minute of it. It's more human revolution but with some new plot points, characters, and great level design that you loved from the base game. It's integrated as well, so as soon as you take the stasis pod, you're put straight in. Remember how I said you lose your augmentations? Well, you can get them back by being given a few Praxis kits from the hacker, but you won't be able to earn all of them by the time you finish it unless you do some exploring and find the 16 Praxis kits that spawn in this DLC. That's right, 16 Praxis kits in a short area. When you finish the DLC, you get your stuff back, but it won't get all the augmentations that you had prior, so you'll either have to earn them back in the later bits of the game, which the next two levels are a lot smaller and easier, so you won't be able to earn much XP, or go through the effort of collecting all of those kits having a YouTube guide on the second monitor. I like that in the original version, Missing Link was marked separately from the base game, so you could just boot it up without needing to load up a save, and I would have preferred to play it that way rather than during a playthrough where I lose everything and only manage to earn some of it back. I mean, if you collect those 16 kits, then it's okay, but I still find it annoying that it's like this. Doom Revolution does a damn good job of establishing its world through the random conversations that you hear people having throughout the game, especially in the hubs. They each have their own motives, views, and perspectives on the world they live in, as well as provide useful information for the player if they pay close attention to it. See, didn't I tell you it was a stupid idea to let those purity first assholes set up camp on our turf? Yeah, but it wasn't our decision, so too bad. Besides, they paid rent like everybody else, so what's the big deal? Come on, these fucks have been coming in here promising all sorts of glory and bullshit if we join them, and all they're doing is getting us killed. You're just jealous because they never took you. After the way they fucked up their op in Milwaukee Junction, they should have just blown up that building sky high with every fucking robohogger inside it. Sanders is all talk. Then why'd you bring him up? I told you, I am not getting arguments. Not for, for this. Our customers would pay much for the services of an augmented girl who can make a lot of money. Then tell customers to get themselves augmented and they can go fuck themselves. I'm sure some already have. Maybe. No. End of talking. It's too dangerous! I'm not changing myself for someone else's pleasure! This isn't the end of the discussion. You'll get the surgery done if you want to keep working. Think about that. One such example are these two guys talking about a secret entrance that they use to get into the Hive, as you can't get in there initially without having a Hive membership card. He mentions a vent in the back of the club, and you end up in the bathroom when you enter it. A nice cheeky way to enter the Hive without paying for it. Another such situation is another two guys talking about where to find guns and equipment, which he points out to a merchant that's inside the Hankwa Hotel, in a room adjacent to the front. Little things like this go a long way to help with immersion and make you feel like you're living in a breathing world that's riddled with conversations and dialogue, so it never feels dead or lifeless. The game's soundtrack is also really good, with every song fit in the game's cyberpunk aesthetic perfectly. It may not top the amazing soundtrack of the original Deus Ex, but it's pretty damn close and a fine good job. They also took parts of the songs from the original and did some remixing for them too.
Most of the game's lore can be found within computer emails, showing all kinds of things from events to concerns and warnings. I'm personally not a fan of discovering story and lore this way as I'm a visual person, so I like seeing what's in front of me through cutscenes and dialogue. But for others, this can be a godsend, and reading some of these messages pays an ode to some of Deus Ex's characters, such as Morgan Everett and Joseph Manderley, two key characters who are part of the Illuminati. Deus Ex Human Revolution is a fantastic immersive sim and is a game that brought immersive sims back into the spotlight, as they would continue to get more exposure and grow with the Dishonored series and Prey 2017, to name a few. It's easily accessible as well, making it a great choice for those who have never played an im-sim before. It has a great gameplay loop, excellent voice acting, great quests, and plenty of replayability thanks to the sheer amount of ways you can navigate and complete objectives. Side note, there's a new game plus mode for those that want to go again and get all those final augmentations, which is a nice touch. I believe it to be incredibly underrated because it's only gotten 21,000 Steam reviews over the decade it's been out for, which is very surprising for a game that sold so well with the original version. Maybe the OG version had more reviews than this one, but I'll never know since it's delisted. Do yourself a favor and go buy this game. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. If I missed anything, comment down below. I'll have more coming to you soon. Peace.